Welcome back. It's time now to get a business update with Owen Ferkel of our business editor. Good morning, Owen. We're going to start with a look at the markets, and there's been a, a real bounce for the first session this week. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Nikkei closing one and a half percent up. That's a pretty good day's trade, and if not the best day this month, then it's going to be up there. I'm sure the Hang Seng still trading, of course, uh, in similar sort of territory. Just the Shanghai letting the Shanghai Composite rather letting the side down a little bit. Uh, GM's listing there, its partnership uh, in Shanghai taking a bit of a hit. That was after the recall of 9,000 Cadillacs uh, made in Shanghai due to a mechanical fault. So that's driving things down a little bit there. No pun intended when I said driving. Now, much of that optimism is being driven by the European Central Bank. From today, it's offering banks a three-year emergency credit lifeline. The aim is to give lenders billions of euros in liquidity in the hope they'll feel more confident about lending. But its latest actions are leaving it open to accusations that it's missing the bigger picture on Europe's debt crisis, as Carl Brown reports. Eurozone economies are feeling the chill, but they may warm to plans by the European Central Bank to provide emergency financing to high street banks. A number are said to be at risk of going under. A report by the ECB this week examined systemic risk. Which shows what is the probability based on some market indicators of two banks failing in the next uh, two years. And that probability has increased. Europe is in the grip of a credit crunch. Banks cannot find liquidity, and that means lending is drying up. So the ECB is extending an emergency credit facility from one to three years, known as longer-term refinancing operations. But some say this isn't enough, and that the ECB should break its own rules to provide financial support for countries rather than banks and become Europe's lender of last resort. I don't understand why the ECB will not take the most simple solution to get rid of the problem, meaning he should pump liquidity to Italy and Spain, thereby solving the banking problem and everything is fine. The central bank has provided appealing financing arrangements before. In 2009, one-year refinancing operations were put out to banks, which then used the cheap loans to buy higher-yielding government bonds. It's hoped this time the three-year refinancing operations generate similar levels of interest, particularly in vulnerable Eurozone countries. Well, we'll get more details of how that uh, ECB lending facility fares when it uh, opens up a little later this Wednesday morning. As we heard in that report there, though, there is big pressure still on the ECB to backstop the rest of Europe. And yet maybe that pressure has eased a little bit. That's largely because borrowing costs for governments around the Eurozone have dropped quite substantially in the last week or so. If we take the example of Spain, the Spanish government uh, sold off uh, just over, well, around five and a half billion euros worth of three-month Treasury bills yesterday. That was a lot more than they forecast. So some very healthy demand for that paper. Uh, we saw yields as well. That's the borrowing uh, costs for the government dropping. You can see there for three month uh, uh, T-bills down to just under 2%. You compare that to a month ago, uh, investors were asking 5% to take on those that sort of debt. Also Italy as well, although its 10 year uh, yields remain at around 6.5%, really too high to be sustainable. They have dipped back a little bit. Good news, of course, for Mariano Rajoy, the new Prime Minister of Spain. He was sworn in officially on Tuesday. And this all, of course, gives him a bigger mandate to make the kind of cuts that he's promised to try and bring Spain uh, back into line uh, and make it uh, uh, bring its debts down uh, and also uh, bring its budget deficit in line with European standards. It all sounds a little bit too promising, though, or are things really looking that much better? Well, it's hard. In a global economy, of course, the problem is you have to get other players on board. And right now, it's the U.S. players who don't really want to get on board with this. We had new figures out from the U.S. government on Tuesday proving that money market funds are still not lending to Europe. They're running scared of their exposure to European banks, concerned that European banks are being consumed by all that toxic debt in countries like Greece and Italy. And in fact, they're exposure to Europe is at its lowest for two years and going down as well. And this is something that the ECB can really not do that much about. Yes, it can provide billions of euros in three-year loans to these banks. But if you can't get the US banks to lend to European banks, then you've got big problems when European banks are trying to tap into dollar funding. Let's now take a look at a few more of the day's business headlines. 
Japanese police have raided the headquarters of Olympus. Officers were joined by prosecutors at the camera makers Tokyo offices as part of their investigation into an accounting fraud that hit up to $2 billion of losses. Olympus shares have regained some of their value after dropping 80% when sacked chief executive blew the sacked chief executive blew the whistle on the scandal. Dexia has sold its Luxembourg unit to a consortium of Qatari investors for 730 million euros. Precision Capital is taking on 90% of the shares in the company. It's part of the Franco-Belgian bank that had to be nationalized by both countries' governments in October with guarantees of nearly 100 billion euros. The Grand Duchy of Luxembourg will hold the remaining 10% of the firm. And TripAdvisor, the website loved and loathed by travellers and hotel owners, makes its stock exchange debut on the Nasdaq later this Wednesday. The firm is being spun off from owners Expedia with a market value of $4 billion. TripAdvisor has posted year-on-year -year revenue growth of 30%, with earnings of $800 million forecast for next year. Well, let's stay in the U.S. now because it appears the U.S. Congress is going to end the year in much the same way as it spent most of the last six months or so, that is deadlocked over the national debt. This time, it's extending a payroll tax cut to around 160 million US workers that is proving too difficult to resolve. The clock is ticking as it always is with budgetary issues. If the two sides, Republicans and Democrats, can't agree on tax cuts, these will expire by the end of the year. Rebecca Boring has more details for us. 2011 in Congress will be remembered as the year of budget battles. After the debt ceiling debacle, another fight is brewing. On Tuesday, the Republican-dominated House rejected a plan for a two-month payroll tax break, sparking the ire of President Obama, who warned of tipping the economy back into recession. This is not a game. This shouldn't be politics as usual. Right now, the recovery is fragile, but it is moving in the right direction. Our failure to do this could have effects not just on families, but on the economy as a whole. If a compromise isn't found before January the 1st, it won't be a happy new year for 160 million workers. They'll see their payroll tax shoot back to 6.2 percent, around $1,000 a year for the average American. Almost 2 million people could also lose their unemployment benefits. A Democrat-controlled Senate passed the two-month extension to the tax cuts on Saturday, but House Republicans are instead demanding immediate talks with senators on a year-long plan. The next step is clear. I think President Obama needs to call on Senate Democrats uh, to go back into session, move to go to conference, and to sit down and resolve this bill as quickly as possible. Partisan squabbles have already helped strip the U.S. of its AAA credit rating. Washington was downgraded by Standard & Poor's in August. Congress heads into 2012 paralyzed by a fresh deadlock, and it's the taxpayer who will take the hit. And we end with a new kid on the block for the most expensive home in New York. Yeah, $88 million for this uh, penthouse. Uh, you only get four bedrooms, which we thought maybe wasn't an awful lot for that kind of money. Uh, step forward Russian, Russian mining billionaire Dmitry Rebolvliolov. Excuse my Russian, I'm sure I mashed that pronunciation. Uh, he's actually bought it for his 22-year-old daughter. Not bad for a crash pad when you're just 22. Uh, I mentioned it has four bedrooms. You get magnificent views of Central Park. Of course you would for that kind of money. Uh, and a wraparound terrace of around 2,000 square feet. Uh, $88 million, it's not the most expensive apartment in the world. That honour remains in London. Uh, in fact, the, mo the most expensive apartment in London uh, went for around $160 million this year. So uh, London still, it appears, outstripping New York when it comes to property prices. Right, and maybe well, she'll be offered that one next. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, very spoiled young lady retreat. indeed. Thanks very much, Owen, for that business update. That's it from me. Thanks for watching live from Paris. Do stay tuned for the latest headlines in just a couple of minutes with Stuart Norville.
road accidents are up there with HIV and malaria on a list of the top 10 causes of death around the world. Join us this week on Health as we investigate research that suggests we should treat bad driving as a disease. Health, today, 10.15am Paris time on France 24. For full coverage of the week's most important news from around the world. of the week in Africa. In-depth reports on current events in each region, the latest developments and analyses. Everything you need to know about international current affairs, 6.40pm Paris time, every day on France 24.